Situated centrally in the national capital New Delhi, the college was established during the modernization phase of India in the year 1960. NDC functions directly under the Ministry of Defence. The course members are of brigadier or equivalent rank officers from the armed forces and joint secretary level officers from the Indian civil services. So far, 69 countries from across the globe have participated in the NDC course. 25 vacancies have been earmarked for the foreign course members, which is one-fourth of the strength of the course. Each study module follows a structured methodology for gaining a comprehensive understanding of the syllabus, which over the years has been constantly updated. Can China act as a moderating uh, factor, notwithstanding all the differences which there are between China and uh, India? I think it's something which we should never rule out. The most important learning is imparted through talks and panel discussions by carefully selected speakers, which include heads of state, ambassadors, ministers, service chiefs, leading economists, industrialists, brilliant scholars, and leading subject matter experts. I want to achieve the comments. Mission in Nigeria, we have missions in Nigeria, 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 a short tea break in between gives the course participants an opportunity to have a more personalized interaction with the speaker. Further learning is imparted through the medium of group-based research. For every study module, the course is divided into seven integrated analysis group under the mentorship of the senior directing staff. The theoretical knowledge is supplemented by learning on ground through focused study tours. These tours are intrinsic to the course curriculum. To spread the learning, each group on return shares their knowledge and experience gained with the whole course through presentations. Talking to members from both Indian military and civil services has really helped improve my understanding uh, far beyond what one can get by reading books of what India is, how the people uh, think, and what their overall goals are. To further supplement theoretical knowledge with practical applications and develop strategic thinking, the college conducts two strategic gaming exercises. Based on a narrative depicting a real-world scenario, students role-play the key portfolios, including the United Nations Security Council, to arrive at decisions and possible solutions. Calling on the Honorable President is one of the highlights of the NDC course. The NDC has had the privilege of being addressed by the President of India at the Rashtrapati Bhavan since 1973. I wish the NDC and all the participants in this course the very best. To our international participants, I hope this has also been a time to discover India and to make friends. Wherever you go, you will carry a bit of India with you. Thank you. Jai Hind. This great tradition has remained unbroken for the last 46 years. In addition to the structured studies, course members research on an assigned topic individually and submit a thesis towards the end of the course. Quality research work by the participants are recognized by the college by sharing selected thesis with the government and also published in the journals. Selected papers are also published in the NDC journal, which is widely circulated and respected. The NDC is affiliated to the renowned Madras University for the award of Masters of Philosophy degree in Defense and Strategic Studies course. Successful students are awarded their degree certificates at a grand convocation ceremony hosted by the college. The legacy of NDC has been creating leaders with the potential to shape 
vision, doctrine and strategy in their respective domains and countries. As the NDC helps its fellows to widen their horizons and encourages them to share experiences, the fault lines and challenges. And finally, discusses ideas that lead to a comprehensive national security. Good morning. The Indian subcontinent is going through a paradigm shift when it comes to its security. While India grapples with, you know, development issues like poverty, equitable distribution, there has been a tectonic shift when it comes to its regional security. When we look at the land borders, there are some neighbors who are pushing those land borders. When we look at the skies, the seas, it's rife with challenges, both by state and non-state actors. So. India, while looking at all those security challenges, has to look beyond. India continues to look at development as a way forward, as it moves forward. We have to look at the security establishment through the lens of holistic development, rather than looking at the security challenges. And what this is an opportunity for is to be able to do that. Ladies and gentlemen, may I now invite the commandant National Defense College, Air Marshal Diptendu Chaudhary, AVSM, VM, VSM to give his opening remarks for the Diamond Jubilee virtual webinar today with the theme, India's national security, a decade ahead. To all the distinguished speakers, to the guests, to the participants, the panelists, uh, and my warm felicitations to the faculty, staff, members of the 60th course, all alumni of the National Defense College, and all the distinguished participants on the Diamond Jubilee of its establishment. The NDC is India's seat of strategic learning, which is dedicated towards preparing future leaders and policymakers for higher responsibility in the realm of national security and strategy. The year 2020, forever famous now as the COVID year, was to have been the year of Diamond Jubilee celebrations. We had many plans for the year, but it all changed. But true to the resilience and strategic adaptability, the college is proud to have mitigated the impact of the pandemic on the 60th course by going online way back on the 31st of March this year and becoming a trailblazer of sorts. It was business as usual at NDC. The events associated with the pandemic and the geopolitical dynamics that erupted in tandem have been a diamond opportunity for all the members who not only witnessed it, but were able to study, analyze, and learn from the events in practicality, uh, real time, and almost on a daily basis. The events of the year were also excellent lessons in statecraft and on matters of national and international security and strategy. Given the immense and varied challenges in the world today at the international, political, multi-level playing field, the need for synergy and for coming together has never been stronger, both within and amongst nations. In the spirit of immense internal and external pressures, all instruments of nations' power needs to come together, not only to navigate the present, but also chart the way ahead. The commitment of the NDC to make the Diamond Jubilee year special has led to many innovative improvements in the course content and the curriculum to make it much more academically robust and contemporary. The most significant change has been the determined efforts to increase the course strength from a current 100 to 110 members in 2021, that is the 64th course, and to the final tally of 120 in the years to follow. This necessitated resolute efforts to enhance the capacity while retaining the heritage premises with extensive renovations and modifications in the college infrastructure. All this has been undertaken while the 60th course was on without letting it affect the curriculum and the tempo. And the credit for this must go to my 
college staff for working tirelessly and pulling together in one direction to make this possible in a solid, robust manner. Over the last six decades, this college has become the institution it has due to the vision of the founding fathers and the cumulative contributions of previous commandants, faculty and staff. The credit for its reputation of excellence must go to the alumni. The college has been privileged to produce. The vast pool of professional excellence, knowledge and strategic abilities which reside amongst the alumni have over the years contributed immensely to the individual services, organizations, governments and the nations. From the first course in 1960 with just 21 participants to progressively evolving over the past 60 years to its present status of 100 members, the NDC has steadfastly contributed to the development of strategic leadership. Its luminous alumni, who today, at the end of the 60th course, shall number 3,999, include four heads of state, numerous service chiefs of armed forces in India and abroad, and a large number of accomplished military leaders, statesmen, public servants, and executives. Since its humble beginning, the college has transformed into an academic institution of strategic excellence through the immense contributions of its faculty, its staff, and members over the years. They have truly done this college proud. Given the backdrop of the current events and the future challenges, India's national security the decade ahead is the theme of the NDC's Diamond Jubilee webinar. After the Honorable Raksha Mantri's speech, the webinar in its pre-lunch session will look at geopolitics in the 21st century. This will be followed by the afternoon session on India in transformation. And tomorrow morning, uh, that is the sixth, we'll look at India's security horizon in the coming decade. Given the array of policymakers, practitioners and strategic thinkers, I am sure that the participant of NDC's Diamond Jubilee webinar will enjoy the debate and discussion over the next day and a half. May I now request the Honorable Raksha Mantri, Sri Rajnath Singh, to kindly deliver the keynote address of the webinar. The Honorable RM would also be e-releasing the NDC book thereafter. Defense Secretary Dr. Ajay Kumar, Excellency Ambassadors, Foreign Dignitaries, Commandant, National Defense College, Air Marshal, Diptendu Choudhury, faculty and staff of the college and members of the 60th course, distinguished officials, ladies and gentlemen. It gives me immense pleasure to address the National Defense College, which is the highest seat of strategic learning in our country on the occasion of its Diamond Jubilee. Let me start by extending my warm congratulations to the commandant and all the staff of the college on completing 60 years of the dedicated service to the nation. The college has produced many strategic leaders and practitioners, not only from India, but also from many friendly foreign countries. Some of the alumni have risen to become heads of their respective countries, armed forces, and many have occupied prominent positions of responsibility in their respective fields. Over the years, the contribution of the alumni of NDC to the strategic community has been immense. Ladies and gentlemen, India is an ancient civilization. Our culture and traditions have been influenced by deep commitment towards peace and welfare. It is not a coincidence that India has been the cradle of major world religion like Hinduism, Jainism, Buddhism, and Sikhism. India is also a melting pot of multiple cultural, social, ethnic, linguistic, and religious influences. It is the defense of this idea of India that represents the core of our approach to national security. Our long history prior to independence and the last 73 years since have been a learning experience for all students of security studies. Perhaps the most fundamental lesson that the roller coaster of the rise and fall of nations taught us was that 
पीस कैन नॉट नेसरली बी अचीव बाई ए डिजायर ऑफ पीस बट बाई द एबिलिटी ऑफ डेटर वार अनफॉर्चुनेटली द मेयर डिजायर टू सीक पीस इफ नॉट रेसिप्रोकेटेड बाई अदर्स डजेंट नेसरली सक्सीड इन बिल्डिंग ए हारमोनियस एनवायरमेंट इन ए वर्ल्ड बिसेट और कॉन्फ्लिक्टिंग आइडियाज ऑफ सिक्योरिटी सावरेंटी एंड नेशनल इंटरेस्ट The last six years provide a blueprint for India's approach towards national security over the next decade. Let me try and outline four broad principles that are likely to guide our quest for national security in the future. The first is the ability to secure India's territorial integrity and sovereignty from external threats and internal challenges. Second. the ability to create secure and stable conditions that can facilitate india's economic growth thereby creating the resources for nation building and to meet individual aspirations third we remain steadfast in desire to protect our interest beyond the borders in areas where our people reside and our security interests converge and finally we also believe that in a globalized and interconnected world a country's security interests are interlinked by shared and secure commons each of these principles is defining the way in which india is approaching various elements of its security policy based on these principles we have brought about drastic changes in our security policy which are oriented towards a strong legally and morally tenable actions we have proved that countries that imply terrorism as an instrument of national policy can also be deterred through options that were considered unimplementable in the past similarly we have undertaken a three pronged approach towards internal security challenges as well this includes development of areas affected by terrorism along with the provision of justice to the aggrieved it also includes the ability and desire to go more than half way to negotiate settlements with dissatisfied groups to enable a political settlement and finally we are also willing to challenge the status quo if the status quo becomes a tool for the exploitation of helpless citizens and the provisions of governance we are cognizant of the fact that india's stability and security are closely associated with the ability to grow economically at a desirable rate this progression can only be sustained through our ability to adopt innovate and strengthen the fundamentals that contribute to this process on the larger issue of economic on the larger issue of economic security the go the government has focused on all aspects of development in sectors of land labor capital and industry we have unleashed the potential of a agricultural marketing re revolution through marketing reforms through important agrarian legislations which you witnessed recently the steps taken are going to make our farmers economically stronger and therefore the country more secure similarly labor reforms were a long pending requirement the recent labor codes social security code occupational safety health and working conditions code the industrial relation code will go a long way in uncluttering the image of a labor market beset with old and unnecessary laws rules regulations etc which have been a bane of for a sound industrial growth in the country they would also bring about ease in doing business to a great extent on the capital front the government has been increasingly and consistently bringing about major changes such as banking sector reforms insolvency and bankruptcy code etc with a view to provide liquidity and opportunity to indian industry to grow at a much higher pace 
Apart from the reforms, we have been making vigorous efforts to stimulate the economy through policies, programs, and projects in all sectors, be it infrastructure, health, education, sanitation, drinking water, energy, etc. And to top it all, the defense sector. As India grows, there is a simultaneous movement of people beyond our shores and a growth of our interests worldwide. This entails that we should be able to safeguard Indian citizens who now work across the globe. In the past, we have displayed the ability to not only evacuate Indian citizens, but also people of different nationalities from warm, torn and calamitous areas. In fact, we have also successfully provided support and relief as the first responder in our neighborhood as well. Our interest to secure trade routes, shipping lines of communications, fishing rights, and communication networks also require the ability to contribute to the global effort to maintain open and free oceans. That is the essence of our initiative to be a part of the Indo-Pacific initiative. India has fostered close relationship and partnership with like-minded friends to further the common interests of countries in the region and beyond. Our strategic partnership with the U.S. is stronger than ever before. Similarly, India's friendship has grown tremendously with Japan over the last few years as well. The India-Australia Virtual Summit in June 2020 has provided a fillip to our already strong comprehensive strategic partnership. We share common concerns with Australia and shared values. India also has a strong traditional and deep-rooted relations with Russia. Our true countries have weathered many a challenge in the past through our close understanding and appreciation of each other's concerns and interests. We continue to build upon our relationship with Russia and especially in the military sphere. India has also forged a very a special partnership with the reliable friends like France and Israel. We value their support and will continue to build upon it in the future as well. Ladies and gentlemen, the Prime Minister took a special interest in the reaching out to our partner countries in West Asia, Southeast and East Asia. It is a result of this initiative that we have enhanced the scope and quality of our relations with Saudi Arabia, UAE and Oman in the West and with Indonesia, Vietnam and South Korea in the East. I see this trend further being enhanced over the next decade. Friends, one of the most important elements of India's friend and the security policy is characterized by the Neighborhood First initiative. Right from 2014, Prime Minister Modi invested substantial personal capital to ensure that this relationship was built and reinforced to create a positive and progressive partnership. The results of this initiative are evident. With the exception of Pakistan, given its agenda of fueling terrorism, India has improved its relations with all neighbors. We have invested heavily to help and support our friends to forge a relationship of mutual respect and mutual interest. Despite all these positives, we have also been confronted with some negatives as well. Pakistan continues to remain adamant in the use of terrorism as a state policy. However, we have achieved substantial success in working with progressive and like-minded countries to not only expose Pakistan's regressive policies, but also make it increasingly difficult to continue with its previous business as usual approach. Recently, India has been facing other challenges 
on its borders. India is a peace-loving country. We believe that differences should not become disputes. We attach importance to the peaceful resolution of differences through dialogue. We are committed to respect for various agreements and protocols that India has entered into for the maintenance of peace and tranquility on our borders. However, India is determined to protect its sovereignty and territorial integrity in the face of unilateralism and aggression, no matter what the sacrifice. I had reserved the last segment of my interaction with you for defense. Let me take you back to what I had said at the beginning of my speech. Peace can only be ensured through the ability to deter war. We have attempted to build this deterrence through a judicious combination of capability development and an emphasis on, on long-term policy of indigenization. This will not only be achieved through encouragement of public and private sector industries in India, as has been outlined in the recent procurement policy, but also by forging partnership with major OEMs who are keen to invest and build in India. Our vision for making India for defense manufacturing is being implemented with the long term of making India more self-reliant. We have received a very encouraging response in this regard and further changes will be undertaken to improve the existing policy as and when needed. The armed forces have also ensured the defense of our borders and interests during this period despite obvious challenges as a result of their well thought out policies and the ability to continue with their operational responsibilities despite the pandemic. I do not need to tell this audience about the evolving and changing character of war. This change is being driven by the multiplicity of challenges and the proliferation of technology that has empowered both the constructive and destructive tendencies of its users. This clearly suggests a widening scope of conflict and its manifestations. It also indicates that unless we can meet these challenges through an equally broad-based all-of-government approach, our efforts are likely to fall short. A large number of initiatives have been undertaken by us in the recent past in this regard. At the structural level, India has a more closely interlinked and coordinated security network. We have not only created the appointment of CDS and established the Department of Military Affairs, but are also in the process of further integrating the armed forces through both theater and functional commands. Reforms have been initiated at the headquarter level within the Army and the MLD as well. All the initiatives will also be accompanied by an improved defense planning process, which will allow us to be better prepared for contingencies and also employ measures to achieve economy in a bid to enhance effectiveness. Ladies and gentlemen, it has always been a challenge to foresee future security challenges. However, the ability to think through possibilities, create capabilities and redundancies is possibly the best way forward to prepare for them. In doing so, our vision must remain uncluttered and our implementation uninterrupted. I am sure that all of you as the present and the future leaders of the countries you represent will play a critical role in the achievement of this vision. I wish you the very best in your future endeavors. Jai Hind. Thank you very much, sir. May I now invite uh, the Honorable Raksha Mantri to launch the e-book on this Diamond Jubilee event. I am delighted to release the e-book of National Defence College on the occasion 
ऑपिट्स डायमंड जुबली Geopolitics frames political discourse through the prism of geopolitical effects on international power politics. While geomilitary capabilities are ever evolving, the geopolitics determines how the relationships will exist. Change of leadership even in one nation can change the entire geopolitics of the world. The change of that nation with other nations and then between the nations around the world so there are no permanent friends or enemies there are only national interests this leads me to invite and it's an honor to invite the chairperson of the next session on the theme geopolitics in the 21st century ambassador sujan chinoy let me introduce uh, ambassador chinoy he's the director of the manohar parikar institute for defense studies and analysis new delhi He's a career diplomat of the Indian Foreign Service. He was India's ambassador to Japan and the Republic of Marshall Islands, the ambassador to Mexico and high commissioner to Belize. A specialist with over 25 years of experience about China, East Asia, Asia Pacific, on deputation with the National Security Council, secretary under the Prime Minister's office, he worked on the internal and external national security policy. He has contributed to Indian newspapers and journals beside lecturing at numerous government institutions think tanks and universities in india and abroad also joining us on the panel today professor c raja mohan he is the director of the institute of south asian studies earlier professor mohan was professor of south asian studies at jawaharlal nehru university new delhi and at the s rajaratnam school of international studies nanyang technological university singapore Professor Mohan associated with a number of think tanks in New Delhi including the Institute of Defense Studies and Analysis the Center for Policy Research uh, the Observer Research Foundation he was also the founding director of Carnegie India New Delhi as the sixth international center of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace Washington DC he has also served on India's National Security Advisory Board he led the Indian chapter of the Pugwash Conferences on Sciences and world affairs from 1999 to 2006 also joining us today is mr peter n vergis peter vergis began as chancellor of the university of queensland on 11 july 2016 prior to this appointment mr vergis extensive career in public service and diplomacy spanned 38 years and included senior positions in foreign affairs trade policy intelligence Most recently he served as a secretary of the department of foreign affairs and trade 2012 to 2016 previous senior appoint appointments include high commissioner of india 2009 to 2012 and high commissioner to malaysia 2000 to 2002 mr vergis was the author of a comprehensive india economic strategy uh, to 2035 commissioned by the australian prime minister and submitted in july 2018 also joining us Dr Ajay Kumar he is the Union Defence Secretary of India Dr Ajay Kumar is a 1985 batch Indian Administrative Service Officer of the Kerala Cadre he is the current Union Defence Minister of India Secretary of India sorry may I apologize uh, Dr Kumar has a degree in bachelor's of technology in electrical engineering from the Indian Institute of Technology Kanpur has a masters of science in development economics from the University of Minnesota and has a doctor of philosophy degree in business administration from Carlson School of Management at the University of Minnesota. Dr. Kumar has immense experience and has served in various sensitive posts in both the government of India and the government of Kerala. Now may I invite Ambassador Chinoy to conduct the session. Thank you very much uh, Mr. Rohit Gandhi for that uh, very warm introduction commandant of uh, the national defense college air marshal d choudhury distinguished participants ladies and gentlemen good morning 
It's a pleasure to participate in the Diamond Jubilee webinar of the NDC on India's national security the decade ahead. We've just heard the keynote address delivered by the Honorable Defense Minister of India, Sri Rajnath Singh. It is an honor for me to chair this morning's session on geopolitics in the 21st century, featuring a distinguished panel of speakers. And I must confess that it helps tremendously that all the three of them are good friends of mine. Friends, an already fragile international compact has been rendered a mortal blow by COVID-19. The pandemic has exposed, exposed flaws in multilateral structures and highlighted the lacunae in national capacities, particularly in healthcare. Multilateralism has suffered deep retrenchment. The politics of the pandemic have diverted the energies of the international community away from key developmental issues. The global economy is reeling from the unexpected effects of the pandemic. Alongside continues to loom the threat of terrorism and other challenges such as climate change and food and energy security. Under the overhang of great uncertainty, international relations are increasingly marked by a proclivity to weaponize trade and technology. Protectionism is gaining ground, power is fractured, hedging and multi-aligning are part of every country's strategic toolkit. The US-China trade war has been disruptive. Never before have all other countries been as interlinked in a web of relations with both China and the United States. This makes for very difficult choices for all others. By the second decade of the 20th century, exactly 100 years ago, the world had already been convulsed by the First World War. It was a war that brought Wilhelmine uh, Germany onto its knees and dismantled the Ottoman Empire. But the peace that followed did not endure. The failure of the League of Nations to develop a stable security architecture led to a resurrection of virulent nationalism in Germany under Hitler's Third Reich. Imperial Japan, then a rapidly rising military power, hungry for natural resources to fuel its industrialization, went from being a partner of the victorious allied powers of the First World War to becoming an inveterate foe in the Second World War. The Second Great War took more than 55 million lives and witnessed the horrific use of weapons of mass destruction. The Cold War saw China swing from adversarial relations with both superpowers to a strategic partnership with the United States. Its economic rise was facilitated by the United States and Japan, among others. Today, China has swung back to being an adversary of the United States. Why is all this relevant today? This is because one must appreciate the ironies and lessons of the last century in order to understand the evolving geopolitics of the 21st century. As a rising power, China's trajectory is reminiscent of both a highly industrialized and militarized imperial Japan of the early 20th century and it will help mean Germany striving for wealth market, that is world power, China's hunger for resources, its Belt and Road Initiative, its community of a shared destiny, these are all throwbacks to Imperial Japan's greater East Asia co-prosperity sphere. China's unbridled nationalism, naval expansion, and attempts to dominate Asia and Africa reminds us of Wilhelmine Germany's conservatism focused on naval expansion, the so-called scramble for Africa, and its new imperialism. Another aspect of this century is the speed with which new technological barriers are being transcended today. We are witnessing unprecedented advancements in lethal technologies, standoff weapons, drones, hypersonic missiles, and space-based platforms. Combined with the disruptive force of artificial intelligence and autonomous weapon systems. The very notion, friends, of critical infrastructure in the cyber domain is changing. There has been a surge in users and data flow in the digital space, particularly at this moment. This has created vast new attack surfaces in personal computers for hackers and cyber criminals, both state and non-state. These circumstances place a fresh premium on getting ahead in the race to develop 5G technologies. 
The emerging contestation is manifested in space as well, with new technologies aimed at degrading space-based ISR capabilities of adversaries. For India, the fundamental goals and objectives in the 21st century are the same as they were in the last century. We wish to achieve rapid and economic uh, growth, inclusive growth at that, in a stable and peaceful environment. Our strategic autonomy is better home today as we pursue issue-based alignment in our national interests. In recent years, India has acquired greater capacity, greater agency in the globe it to play a role in the global arena. Aided by the strength of its democratic institutions, economic potential, enhanced military capabilities and partnerships, and resolute political will. Our ability to work with key partners, such as the United States, Japan, Australia, and France, will strengthen our role as an active participant. Friends, the changes taking place in the Indo-Pacific are of the greatest consequence to all of us. China's rise, particularly its unilateralism and assertive policies have proved to be a major disruptor. Decoupling in trade and the building of resilient supply chains are key objectives, but will take time. However, it is in the technology space that the divisions are most acute. If we succeed in resolving the accumulated contradictions of the past, there is every chance that the decades ahead will see the emergence of a stable and inclusive multipolar order. If we fail to do so, there is every possibility that the world will drift towards sharper contradictions, sharper contestation in trade, technology, territory, and tenets. Clearly, globalization and economic integration have not proved sufficient conditions for keeping the lid on geostrategic contestation. To guarantee peace and prosperity in the 21st century, like-minded countries must work together to forge new partnerships and collaborative structures. In this complex scenario, the Indo-Pacific vision, the quadrilateral security dialogue, the D10 Club of Democracies, the Five Eyes Intelligence Network, and the Global Partnership on Artificial Intelligence will bring together key stakeholders to build a better world. So much rides today on the outcome of the US elections, which we are all following with great interest. Much depends on whether the United States will rejoin the uh, CPTPP, honor the JCPOA, whether the United States will rejoin the Paris Agreement on climate change and resume its leadership role in multilateral institutions. Today, to dwell on all these issues, we have with us three very distinguished panelists. They will throw more light on this subject. We have Dr. C. Rajamohan, the director of the Institute of South Asian Studies in Singapore, who will speak to us on the evolving world order. He'll be followed by Mr. Peter Verghese, earlier the Chancellor of the University of Queensland and Secretary of DFAT in Canberra, as also the High Commissioner of Australia to India. He will speak on new areas of power contestation. And finally, Dr. Ajay Kumar, the Defence Secretary of India, who has great experience in matters to do with technology, will speak about technology, a key variable. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I propose to give 20 minutes to each of our panelists. Uh, this will be followed by a Q&A session, which will last for about 30 minutes. And then, uh, as required, I will attempt a few words by way of summation. Our first speaker is Dr. C. Rajamohan, all the way from Singapore. Dr. Rajamohan, the floor is yours. May I request all other panelists, non-speakers, to kindly mute their mics. And I request attendees, participants who are listening in and watching this uh, webinar to kindly address questions in the prescribed format and if possible to also identify the panelists to which the question is addressed. The floor is yours, Professor C. Rajamohan. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Chinoy. Uh, let me uh, begin by congratulating the National Defense College uh, on the celebration of its uh, Diamond Zubli. 
uh, I have personally had the privilege of uh, long association, uh, at least since the mid 1980s. I've had a chance to regularly be at the college and speak to the uh, students there. Uh, I also had an opportunity uh, to participate in the Golden Jubilee uh, Symposium that took place exactly 10 years ago in October. Uh, that, that too was a, was, a, was a great experience. Now, today, I think it's uh, for me, it's a special honor to be part of this seminar and to share the platform uh, with Ambassador Chinoy, uh, Ambassador Peter Verghese and Secretary Ajay Kumar. Uh, the focus of my presentation uh, is on the world order, how it is changing. Uh, in some ways, uh, Ambassador Chinoy has already laid the groundwork, has cleared a lot of, uh, uh, is laid out a lot of uh, issues uh, before you. What I do is just pick up five themes and uh, then uh, make my presentation around those five themes and conclude with a brief uh, discussion of, uh, of what might be India's options and possibilities. So the five themes I uh, propose to take up are the return of the great power rivalry, uh, which is which is with us today. Uh, the rethinking on economic globalization that has been the dominant feature of the international system for the last three decades and more. The crisis in the multilateral institutions, uh, which tend to produce global governance. Uh, the emergence of uh, digital technologies that promise to disrupt a, a lot of things in the world uh, from uh, politics to security and defense. And finally, uh, the question of uh, the crisis in man's relationship with nature, uh, that what we've taken for granted, that we can keep doing what we want, but the nature will remain a stable uh, background system. I think we are today uh, in entering a major crisis that's going to uh, take up a lot of uh, the energies of the governments and states around. Uh, so let me start by, uh, to the to start with the uh, focus on the great power rivalry. Uh, for nearly three decades uh, after the end of the Cold War, uh, around 1989 to 1991, uh, we've seen a, a relative harmony and stability uh, among the major power relations, uh, that no power was threatening the other, and this harmonious uh, circumstance uh, provided a, a good basis for doing a lot of other things uh, in the international system. But of course, that, that structure rested on the fact that the US was the dominant power, uh, at least in the 1990s. Uh, Russia was not willing to contest it. Uh, China was too was just beginning to rise. It was not willing to challenge the US primacy. And the Europeans uh, largely celebrated their uh, special relationship with, uh, with, uh, with the US. Now, what we've seen in the last few years is really the breakdown uh, of this of the system of uh, where we have uh, the, the rise and assertion of China, uh, the growing conflict between Russia and the United States, uh, two, uh, and the differences between US and Europe too, we must mention that, uh, together how today producing a very, very different context uh, in which the international system uh, has to operate. And all indications are that this feature uh, is going to be very much part of our life uh, for the in the near term. Now, within this great power rivalry, now, Ambassador Chinoy has, Chino has already mentioned it. It's really the question of U.S.-China uh, confrontation uh, that's beginning to uh, beginning to unfold. For nearly five decades, uh, U.S. and China have been partners, and the integration of their economies uh, and their uh, collaboration on a range of issues uh, has been the dominant feature for Asia and for the world as a whole. But today, the Chinese are beginning to uh, test that relationship. And I think Americans are finally reacting to the Chinese assertion. And there we have a number of things begin to unfold. Uh, the question of US alliances in Asia, uh, how will they endure uh, in, the, in the days ahead uh, amidst the rise of uh, China because the alliances were largely constructed to deal with the Soviet power. Today, they must deal with the China question. A uh, second, how would the uh, this distribution of power within Asia, how is it going to going to play play out in the region? And does the rise of China, which is the in the heart of Asia, uh, is it likely to produce uh, some uh, new alignments, some de-alignments and some realignments? We've already begun to see that in, in, uh, in a number of uh, cases in East Asia where I live, uh, Philippines, one of the oldest allies of the United States, uh, today is in a very different place uh, than it was a few years ago. Uh, South Korea, Thailand and the ASEAN as a whole today deal with 
a, a, a an uncomfortable situation of US China rivalry, and each one is crafting a way out for themselves. So this is going to be how to deal with the US China relationship uh, is going to be the uh, biggest challenge uh, for all the other countries uh, in the international system, uh, especially uh, in, uh, in, in Asia. But of course, this, this contestation is not going to be boundless or are there conditions for ameliorating this or limiting this? We must at least think of three factors that could constrain a full-blown conflict between the between the two. I mean, not talking about the nuclear issue, but three other factors. One, there is internal political volatility. Uh, you just have to look at what's going on in the U.S. elections today. Uh, there will be questions on whether uh, if President Biden takes charge, uh, will he continue with the policies that Trump uh, has has followed in the last few years? And there, of course. What we see less of it, uh, there must be debates within China. So the internal politics of China and the US are going to be major variables in how this plays out. Second, I think the 50 years or 40 years of economic integration between US and China, it's not going to be easy to decouple uh, the two economies and how far, how exactly that will be done is, a, is the other factor. Third, uh, both in US and China, there will be temptations for finding some accommodation uh, between between themselves, sometimes we call it G2, but how that accommodation gets worked out and how the others will, might get affected by it, that's always going to be uh, an issue and I think uh, we'll have to continue to deal with it. So, so on the great power situation, we are in a new area, an uncharted terrain, terrain in which one, the conflict between great powers we are familiar with, what we are familiar, less familiar with, the rise of a great power within our neighborhood, the last time a great power emerged in our neighborhood was Japan, the Imperial Japan. And the consequence of that were fairly severe and the Indian army was very much part of uh, dealing with it. Uh, today, the rise of China is going to produce deep instabilities and in how this great power in our neighborhood. In the past, we could talk about US and Russia. They were distant powers. But today, China is next door uh, on our mountains, on our seas. So this is going to be a fundamentally different kind of situation uh, that we have to deal with. The second uh, set of issues, which is really globalization, that for three decades, I mean, or more, starting from the late 1980s, uh, it was assumed that, look, open borders, uh, freedom for the movement of capital and labor across the frontiers was now the new norm. It was called the Washington Consensus. And the question is, how do other countries simply adapt to this new situation of free movement of capital, free movement of goods, open borders, and open, you know, easier access for labor to move from one country uh, to another. But today what we're seeing is a threat to all these basic premises that, that uh, under Trump, we saw uh, the question of America's open borders being debated, uh, the question of trade, the free movement of goods being debated, and the questioning of uh, labor movement, whether it is skilled labor or otherwise, H-1B visas is a big issue. And it's also an issue not just in the US, uh, we've seen it emerge uh, in, in Europe, uh, in Britain, where the uh, Brexit was largely, the immigration questions were largely major issues. So what we have is that the, the, the American the West preached us the globalization, gospel of globalization, but today the resistance to globalization has largely come from within the developed world. Because until recently, it was common for all of us to say, look, Americans are imposing globalization. But Trump is saying exactly that. I don't want more globalization. The others have taken advantage of America in a globalized world. So that's not the argument that we're used to, uh, but we're going to see more of that. And I think even President Biden, he's made it clear that there's going to be no return to the old uh, ideologically driven free trade, that we're not going to do free trade just because we think it is politically correct. Uh, he's promised not to do new trade agreements without enough workers' rights, uh, without enough environmental safeguards. So we're going to have actually how trade and globalization is going to be organized uh, is going to be uh, quite, quite different. While many of us blame the United States for raising questions about globalization, uh, we must not forget that China was the one who actually started this. It's easy to forget in the, because we tend to focus so much on the US, uh, that after all, the closing of the um, Chinese cyberspace to foreign companies was done by, by China. China was seeking access to the rest of the world, but at the same time, trying to protect its domestic industry, promoting its own capabilities within. So, and then China's participation 
are in the WTO and the distortion of the WTO system where one country gains it for its own purposes. That this is, you know, WTO, GATT, they're not some kind of a Moses code. They're not Ten Commandments. They're based on the premise that it will work for all the major countries. But today that question, does WTO economic globalization work for the American working people? Does it work for everyone? It's not quite clear. Therefore, some pushback against globalization uh, is going to happen. And within China, Xi Jinping has just announced the dual circulation strategy, uh, which is focused more on the internal economic development while separating the external engagement. Of course, they're not going to give up on BRI. They're not going to give up on a whole range of economic penetration of the rest of the world, but they will try and keep these two separate. That is, continue the domination of the international system while at the same time protecting its own internal structures from uh, engagement with the, with the rest of the world. So, so this is not going to be sustainable. So therefore, some rearrangement of economic globalization, uh, I suspect, is inevitable. And dealing with that is going to be uh, a major challenge uh, for all of us in the, in, the, in the days ahead. That brings me to the third set of institutions, which is the, uh, we've taken for granted uh, after the Cold War, that the UN, the WTO, UN Security Council, and a whole range of international institutions were here to stay and that they would set the norms. Uh, today, I think that myth, has been shattered as the US and China fight in WTO, WHO, uh, you name it, across the board in a range of international institutions that the great power rivalry uh, is going to influence the, uh, the, the international system and the international institutions. The idea that international institutions can be separated from the great power politics as if it is an autonomous, apolitical, uh, you know, value neutral exercise. That illusion is no longer sustainable. There is going to be conflict on WTO, on WHO, on the UNSC. And Ambassador Chinoy mentioned in his speech that there will be new institutions. The institutions that we've seen rise beyond the UN and others in the last few years, there are going to be new institutions. We already have the BRI as an global, one of the biggest global financial and uh, infrastructure institutions. We're not talking about the Quad, that talking about creating an alternative to some of the Chinese institutions. So therefore, the idea that, uh, that it's a, we are in a stable situation is no longer there and that new institutions will be created, new norms will be created, but then these will have to be negotiated. Some of them like on trade collectively, some of them like on 5G, on telecom, where Australia was the one to take the lead on raising questions about Chinese uh, telecom companies. Today, there will be new rules, there will be new regulations dealing with a whole range of issues. And here again, uh, India will have to actively participate in the new institution. It's not enough to merely say, oh, we are abiding by WTO, we are good citizens of the United Nations, uh, we always respect international rules. Look, that is of no consequence. The question is today, are we prepared to actively reshape the global institution? And I think that is India's historic opportunity today. It has the resources, it has the political will and the capability to make a difference to shaping of the new institutions. And for India, for those, all of you, the strategic thinkers that NDC is going to produce, it is this going to be one of the greatest excitements and opportunities as we, as we look ahead. And that brings me to the fourth question. And among the changes that we need to do is on the digital domain. Uh, just 20 years ago, uh, it looked like there was a digital utopia. There will be borderless world. Uh, everybody is going to be happy on the internet. And what we've seen happen in the last decade is something completely different. The emergence of strong surveillance states, the emergence of surveillance capitalism that Google and Apple uh, or other companies can monetize your data without your permission. So these questions are being raised, not just uh, in the United States, Across the world today, the question of how do you deal with the digital transformation? It is affecting our politics, seeing the social media, the role uh, that Twitter can censor the president of the United States. Uh, we've seen the Russians accused of interfering in US elections. So we talk about political organization, political intervention by other powers, and the whole question of uh, Ambassador Chino referred to artificial intelligence or you know, robotic weapons. So you're going to have a full spectrum of consequences of rise of technology and creating new norms for it. Uh, India at least is familiar on the nuclear debate. I mean, 
75 years ago when the nuclear age dawned, India tried to participate, shape, but India did not have the power to shape the outcomes uh, on NPT or other systems. But today, India must actively take the initiative to join other like-minded countries, whether it is on 5G, whether it's on digital governance, whether it is on cross-border flows of data, that India will have to take the leadership in working with the like-minded countries. It's not always going to be agreements with them either, that therefore we need a clear conception and the ability to participate in shaping uh, the new norms that will come. Uh, on the space side, for example, you have today uh, Elon Musk and uh, uh, Amazon today launching thousands of satellites and Chinese are doing the same thing. So what are the new rules in space going to be worked out? In the old days, we just relied on, okay, in the UN, we stand up and argue for something, but today, the private sector is involved. The domestic cap a whole range of other actors are involved today. Therefore, there again, rules are not going to be devised in the UN, but they're going to be devised by like-minded countries. And to influence rulemaking, you need the capability to shape rulemaking. And that's where the biggest challenge for India, are both an opportunity to, to be able to contribute to a new set of rules on how technologies are going to be managed, but at the same time, multiple challenges uh, for us uh, in the domain. And finally, climate change. That this idea that, look, we can keep doing what we're doing uh, and that there will be no difference uh, to the rest of the, the hemisphere on what we call Anthropocene, that is man-made change is dramatically altering our environment. I don't have to say this to my uh, friends in Delhi. Uh, you see the what happens when Punjab burns its fields, uh, how what kind of air we breathe in Delhi. So in, and that's a fairly local when one country phenomenon, but what we're seeing is really uh, the use of fossil fuels, uh, the use of uh, uh, how that changes the global environment. And this is no longer an abstract debate. It's affecting finance. It's affecting every single aspect of future of agriculture, uh, future of uh, managing a whole range of areas are going to be influenced by whether we say addressing climate change in terms of limiting it, in terms of managing its consequences, we could have a full range of issues. And if Biden does take charge, uh, at least a section of the Biden administration is going to make climate change the principal issue before us and dealing with that is going to be a huge, huge uh, thing. And I think here, uh, India under present government has moved from saying, oh, sorry, we didn't do anything to create the problem. Therefore, uh, we're not going to be part of the, any solution. Uh, our position has already changed on that. Today, we are actively participating. We created the Solar Alliance. Uh, we talked about a disaster resilient infrastructure building. And today in Delhi, you tell the Indian people that, look, no, no, we didn't create the problem. Uh, that is not going to wash and be seeing the need for India to more actively participate in shaping a new set of rules uh, to deal with the climate change. My time is running out. I'll just say the same applies to the virus. That man is pushing into limiting the space for all other beings in the, in the, in the planet. And at some point, we're going to run into this. And today, the COVID-19 pandemic is not going to be the only pandemic. And we're going to see more of that. There again, our relationship with nature, uh, how we arrange that relationship in a non-destructive, non-mutually beneficial way uh, is philosophically, policy-wise, is going to be the biggest challenge. So let me conclude by simply saying that for India, I think it's an unprecedented opportunity today uh, to break from some of the old uh, self-imposed constraints and to start on first principles. I mean, what is changing in the world? What are India's interests? And if the and how do we address them? Rather than saying, this is what my mantra said, therefore, uh, I'm going to do X, because the mantra says Y. But I think today, we got to start from the first principle of the basics of saying, what are the challenges that we confront in the global geopolitics? And what do we need to do to secure India's interests? I think, as Ambassador Chinoy and Ambassador Vergis and Secretary Kumar might agree, uh, that is does not often happen for many generations. And I think for us today to be able to ask basic questions and find answers to that is going to be an exciting enterprise, both for all of us, as well as for the NDP as it looks for the next decade and more. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you very much, uh, Professor C. Raja Mohan, for uh, making those very perceptive and incisive uh, remarks and, and I particularly uh, want uh, our audience to focus on the five themes that you uh, 
spoke about today. In fact, uh, I dare say that if appropriately handled, these five issues can become the five new principles of peaceful coexistence for the world, uh, covering great power rivalry, uh, the imperfect uh, globalization that we have seen so far, the crisis in multilateral cooperation and institutions, uh, the threats that are emerging, the contestation and transformation of the digital space, and ultimately the most important of all issues, which is our environment. Uh, so thank you for those remarks and, and for particularly highlighting the potential for India to play a much bigger role in framing rules for this coming new world. I now turn to our next speaker, Ambassador Peter Varghese, uh, who will address us over the next 20 minutes on new areas of power contestation. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Varghese, for joining us. The floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Chinoy, and um, can I say at the outset uh, a very warm thank you to the National Defence College uh, and to the Commandant for the opportunity to uh, participate in this um, Diamond Jubilee event. Um, I recall very fondly my interactions with the College when I was Australia's High Commissioner to India a little while ago now, and in particular the opportunity to deliver a lecture and to interact with um, what were very incisive and forensic questioning from, uh, from the college. Um, I want to offer a, a personal Australian perspective on uh, the issues that um, uh, have already in, a, in his characteristically incisive way been laid out by, uh, by Raja. Uh, and to do so in the context of uh, not just the Indo-Pacific environment, but the, bro the broader global environment. And while uh, I've been asked to speak on new challenges, um, I should say that what we face into the future are not so much new challenges as the um, uncertainties that a profound transition in our strategic environment uh, throwing up. Um, I mean, historically, if you look at the nature of strategic challenges, it's very rare for an absolutely brand new challenge to come along. Um, the form of challenges changes over time, the context certainly changes, the actors change. Uh, but probably with the exception of technology, it's rare for uh, a brand new challenge to be added to the relatively narrow band of strategic challenges. Uh, and the first point I want to make is that uncertainty is the largest enemy of strategic stability. And that's a particularly opposite point at the moment because we are, in my view, um, facing a, a bonfire of certainties, if I could characterize it that way, uh, when it comes to our strategic environment, uh, for many of the reasons that Raja uh, set out in, uh, in his remarks. Um, and COVID has simply been uh, one additional thread of uncertainty uh, in that environment. Um, overall, I think what we will recognize as um, COVID's contribution is more as an accelerant uh, of trends that were there in one form or another uh, pre-COVID rather than a creator of uh, fundamental new threats with one possible exception which I'll come to later in my remarks which is its impact on the geoeconomics uh, of, uh, of the world. Um, let me, let me start with some of the themes that Raja covered and perhaps offer a, a complementary perspective on them, um, beginning with uh, the international order. Now, Australia, of course, has been a great beneficiary of the so-called rules-based international order. Uh, we're not big enough or rich enough to buy or bully our way in the world, and so uh, we are a beneficiary of any system uh, which seeks to uh, 
uh, curtail uh, or at least restrain uh, a might is right regime for the conduct of international uh, relations. And as we lament the passing uh, of this current order, it's worth recognizing that its creation was the product of uh, a fairly unique combination of circumstances. Uh, and by that I mean that the strongest power in the post-Second World War world, namely the United States, decided in a uh, completely ahistorical uh, sense that the best protection for its hard interests lay in the creation of a system of international rules, the promotion of concepts of public goods uh, and also of international norms and international law. And that is an uncharacteristic position for the strongest global power to uh, adopt. Um, and what it did, and I think this was the reason why it achieved the success it did, was that it created an alignment, a broad alignment, between geopolitical power and multilateral um, achievement. Uh, and as, as Raja indicated, you cannot divorce the two. And when you seek to divorce power from multilateralism, you end up with a very ineffective regime. Now, for very complicated reasons, the United States has, uh, at least under the Trump administration, we'll see what happens if uh, that were to change in the next few days, uh, has decided that it no longer wants to invest uh, in that type of rules-based international order uh, and that it sees the balance of benefit as not serving US interests. Um, and accordingly, I think we are seeing a rapid unraveling um, of a system which I think has broadly served us well. Now, I'm not one of those who believe that multilateralism is dead. Uh, but I do believe that um, the system we have become accustomed to uh, is already on life support and close to the graveyard. And so the big challenge we're going to face is how do we reinvent multilateralism? Because the concept of global problems, problems without borders, the need for concerted action uh, is not going to go away. Um, if anything, it will only increase whether we're dealing with climate change or non-proliferation um, or a whole host of other issues. Uh, and so I think we're going to face a period where multilateralism is essentially replaced by variations of minilateralism. Uh, is I don't think we're going to return to the days of global multilateral organizations that functioned on the basis that nothing is agreed until everything is agreed and that you needed a complete international consensus to uh, agree on action. Uh, I think instead we're going to see a very fluid shifting set of uh, opportunistic coalitions as countries with common interests decide to work together when it suits them and uh, those groupings will change over time and they will change depending on the nature of the um, of the issue now at one level that might look like a very weak substitute but i think in a rather paradoxical way uh, what it will actually mean is a restoration of some sort of alignment between power and multilateral achievement. Because if countries that are in a position to do something about an issue are able to find common ground and act upon it, uh, then we may see things moving, uh, even if we end up with half a loaf rather than uh, a, full, a full loaf. So. Um, in terms of new challenges, I would put that um, first on my list. Secondly, is the, is the question of, you know, what do we do about this new strategic fault line between the US and China? Uh, the return, as Raja said, of great power rivalry. 
uh, after, I guess, only five minutes of geopolitical sunshine between the end of the Cold War uh, and the global financial crisis, which I think in some ways is a marker uh, of the beginning of US-China tension. I think fundamentally what we're dealing with here are two competing and ultimately irreconcilable strategic ambitions. Uh, China is looking for predominance, strategic predominance, uh, at least in the Indo-Pacific, uh, if not more broadly. Uh, and the United States is determined not to concede strategic predominance to China or indeed to anyone else. Uh, the US as number one, I think, is deeply ingrained in the strategic DNA of the United States and it will resist uh, a peer competitor seriously challenging it. Um, so this leaves the rest of us, which is the rest of the world, uh, with a rather difficult conundrum. Um, we are now seeing uh, the, ab the abandonment of engagement as the primary axis for the China relationship, whether it is the United States or with others. Uh, and what replaces it, and from an Australian perspective, very importantly, what can replace it short of containment, uh, I think is the big geopolitical challenge in our region. Um, my own view is that ultimately we will need to end up uh, with a framework with it, which is engage and constrain. Uh, we cannot pretend China away. Uh, we cannot, we do not have the luxury of not dealing with China. Uh, but equally, uh, if we were to try and revive a Cold War era containment of a China as globally integrated into the economy, the global economy as is, and the largest trading partner for uh, most of the countries in the world, um, that is going to end in tears. And so rather than containment, I think, uh, we will be reaching, feeling our way um, towards a policy of constraining China. Um, and uh, the Quad, in my view, will be the beginnings of uh, the shaping of that policy. And um, for both India and Australia, I think that will become a more important a feature of our strategic policy. Now, uh, I think it's important not to get ahead of ourselves when we talk about the Quad. Uh, I don't see the Quad as a grand military alliance. I don't see it as uh, an Asian NATO. Uh, I don't see it ever reaching the point where there's an agreement that an attack on one is an attack on all. But to the extent that the Quad can succeed in over time constraining China, it involves constructing a new strategic equilibrium in our region, which enables leverage to be a two-way street. In other words, for leverage to be not something that China exerts to take advantage of its economic heft, but rather something that can also operate in the other direction. Uh, and to do that, the Quad will have to build up uh, a much greater degree of common ground and common purpose, uh, whether it is diplomatic, economic or strategic, in how it collectively deals uh, with China. And I think we also need to be realistic about whether the Quad itself can expand to include the countries of Southeast Asia or other countries um, such as uh, Korea, because I suspect in the end, Southeast quietly barrack for the Quad, but it is very unlikely to want to openly be associated with something which China sees as essentially directed um, against it. So 
how all of that plays out in the Indo-Pacific will be not so much a new challenge for us, but I think a new manifestation of a challenge that we could see brewing for some considerable period of time. Um, and um, <clears throat> the other um, point of uncertainty that we face that I wanted to mention uh, before moving on to how we might respond to this is um, to look at what a um, geoeconomic environment of probably prolonged relatively low economic growth is going to mean for all of us. Now, this will partly be driven by um, uh, a, a measure of deglobalization. I don't think globalization can be completely reversed, uh, but I think it's inevitable that there will be a slowing of, de of, of globalization as countries ponder about the vulnerabilities of their economies to disruptions in the supply chain uh, and as the politics of protectionism and the politics of populism begin to exert a stronger hold on many of our countries. Um, the last four decades has been an economic story. The next few decades is going to be a political economy story. And by that I mean um, since the opening up of China in the late 70s um, through to the global financial crisis or, or to now, there was a broad consensus, whether in the developed economies or the developing emerging economies, about the policy mix that leads to success. Um, and I think that consensus has now disappeared both in developed economies and in emerging economies. And what is taking its place at the moment uh, is likely to be um, much less successful in economic growth. And I'm referring to the siren calls of self-sufficiency. I'm referring to uh, a weariness about um, open economies, a slowing in global trade, um, a need over time, I think, for all of us to learn how to re-prosecute the case for an open economy uh, in a very different domestic and global uh, political uh, context. Um, and um, low growth is going to create, I think, significant internal tensions uh, in a number of countries. I don't think there'll be any country really that's completely exempt from this, but it will also exacerbate all of those other geopolitical tensions that uh, flow from this transition that we are uh, uh, that we are facing. Um, let me just spend a couple of minutes before concluding on what all of that adds up to for, say, a country like Australia, and some of these will have echoes for India and for other countries. Um, I think, firstly, it's going to put a premium on the strengthening of our national defence capabilities and our um, strategic resilience. Um, Australia will uh, need to navigate its interests in a world where, while I don't think we will be necessarily a lonely power, uh, we will be uh, operating in an, in an environment where we will have to rely more on our own resources. Um, I don't think that's going to mean a turning of our back on the alliance relationship with the United States because uh, the benefits of that alliance, whether it's in technology or intelligence or in its broader deterrent value, will continue to exert um, a, a logic of its own. Uh, but I think they will be more readiness on the part of our strategic thinkers uh, to imagine and to plan for uh, dealing with the challenges we face uh, on a more independent national basis. Secondly, I think we are going to have to work harder 
and a core set of strategic relationships that bring together both our economic and geopolitical interests. And India will be very prominent amongst those. Indonesia will also be amongst them, Japan, uh, and then other countries in uh, Southeast Asia. Um, this is all part, I think, of a much more multipolar strategic environment uh, that Australia and others uh, are going to have to navigate. Uh, but perhaps more important than anything on the geopolitical front, um, Australia will have to turn its attention to serious economic reform and economic growth. And it goes back to my point about re-prosecuting the case for an open economy, because at the end of the day, uh, it is your economic strength and your economic resilience that define both your strategic opportunities and your strategic vulnerabilities. And uh, unless that is addressed, um, very little else on the strategic front can, uh, can follow. Um, so let me just conclude um, really with this observation. I think it's particularly relevant to uh, a National Defence College. Uh, and that is that um, our strategic planners um, and our leaders uh, are going to have to learn to operate in uh, an increasingly complicated ecosystem uh, where um, everything is connected to everything else and where adjustments in one area can have very significant implications in another area. This is the sort of butterfly effect writ large uh, and uh, an economic wave leading to a strategic tsunami. So the premium that we will have to place on our military officials, our defense leadership, um, our civil service and our political leaders having an integrated view of the economic and the strategic, understanding how the different facets of an ecosystem come together and what it means for policy making and strategy, uh, I think is going to be fundamental to um, our future. So I'll end my comments there and I look forward to um, further discussion during question and answer. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Peter Varghese, for uh, those very illuminating uh, and very informative uh, remarks that you've just made and for drawing particular attention to this uh, very uncertain world in which uh, there will continue to be irreconcilable differences between the United States and China. And I think the need, as you emphasize, to create uh, new structures, a new kind of uh, modus vivendi, if I may use that term. Uh, and you also highlighted the drift towards a political economy for the world um, as different from the past decades where we had, uh, you know, an economic uh, kind of arrangement purely based on market principles. Uh, and I particularly uh, endorse the point that you made about an all of stakeholder approach. Uh, while operating in a very complex environment. Thank you very much indeed. I now turn to our uh, uh, next speaker, that's uh, Dr. Ajay Kumar, the Defense uh, Secretary of India, uh, who has a vast experience on matters to do with technology. Uh, he will speak to us over the next 20 minutes on technology, a key variable. Over to you, Dr. Ajay Kumar. Thank you very much for joining us. Good afternoon. I hope I am audible. Yes, uh, very well. Thank you. Thank you. So once again, uh, good afternoon, everyone. And my uh, greetings to all, uh, everyone, all the participants and the faculty of NDC for this glorious Diamond Jubilee. And my compliments on having organized this wonderful webinar to commemorate the Diamond Jubilee. Uh, I am going to be uh, talking briefly on a major shift in perspective that we are in India are attempting in terms of our development of defense production ecosystem. Over the last several decades, we have been able to create 
a defense manufacturing ecosystem which can boast of productions ranging over 10 billion dollars in the country but if we will look look at our goals which talked of self reliance and as how far we have been able to achieve the self reliance that we had aimed for one of the immediate things that strikes us is that a lot of this production that happens actually has been based on licensed technologies and as a result of which even though we are value adding in terms of manufacturing that happens in the country we were not really self reliant when we are looking at strategic uh, you know strategic independence this dependence on technology puts constraints both in terms of the quantity as well as further improvements on those technologies it also has implications on costs because licensed technology comes up with a cost and which makes the domestic production cap uh, capability inherently costlier than what the imported version is we have therefore despite the fact that we have produced aircrafts tanks ships we still have continue to be dependent on uh, various other uh, countries for our armed forces requirements for the first time now today india the new india that we are talking about is aspiring to move away from this today we are looking to see how we can actually lead in terms of creating technology meeting our requirements based on our technology as well as providing the support of our technology to our friendly countries this confidence that we have been able that this is possible comes from various trends that the country has evidenced in other sectors as well as in defense to a certain extent let me start by saying that today india is one of the largest design and development centers of the world today we have over 1000 global companies who have one of their biggest and in some cases their biggest design and development centers in india the design and development export from these global companies alone exceeds 15 billion dollars a year and is growing india has displaced other major design development centers of the world from the global map in this regard we have also seen that in sectors like space we have been able to make laudable progress today we have become one of the few countries who have been able to send satellites to various other uh, to mars we are planning to send a man to the space and we have capabilities where we are in a position to help other countries to launch their satellites so this inherently provides us the capability of r and d that exists in the country in various allied sectors and it remains how we can bring this capability now to the defense and aerospace sector the second big development which gives us encouragement is the very vibrant startup ecosystem india is today the world's third third largest startup ecosystem 
with nearly 50,000 startups which are active in the country. We have, before the onset of pandemic and pandemic has brought certain lull, which I'm sure once the pandemic is over, is going to go, we are going to go back to the earlier trends. We had roughly investment of $4 billion and more in the startup ecosystem in every quarter. That is translates to roughly about $16 billion plus over the year, which was happening into a startups ecosystem. Today, we have 31 unicorns which have come out of the Indian startup ecosystem. And experts say that this number can go up to 100 in by 2025. A lot of these startups, interestingly, are in the tech space. And there are nearly 2000 startups in deep tech space. And it is these technology based startups, especially when we are looking at increased thrust of technology in defense platforms. I think these startups have give us the confidence that there is great possibility of doing uh, using the startup ecosystem for our defense requirements. The third great strength that we need to leverage in this journey towards using greater uh, self-reliance in technology is our strengths on the software side. As a country, we, I don't have to say, India is today globally recognized as a leader for software and software services. We are also aware that recently, Tata Consultancy became the world's number one software company, leaving behind likes of Accenture, IBM, and many others who, have, who were the world leaders in the past. We are a country which is producing over 80,000 to 90,000 engineers and other graduates who are today available to this industry. The fact that today Indians are dominating the global IT industry, the CEO of Google Global, Microsoft, Adobe, Nokia, Cognizant, IBM, and other companies. They are all people from Indian origin who have come out of Indian system. These, if these people have been able to create such a niche, if this industry has been able to create the software for defense platforms in the best platforms of the world. It is, it is our duty to see that we are able to use this talent to channelize it to meet our requirements. And the last point that I would like to mention with respect to our strengths is the leveraging of our academic system. I have already talked about the large number of graduates that we produce every year. The new education policy that has come has had some transformational reforms in our higher education system. For the first time, we are looking to open our academic system to the international world, Indian universities opening campuses outside, making Indian university ecosystem multidisciplinary so that it is possible that knowledge from other disciplines flow into each other. And the creation of the National Research Foundation, which will all provide greater thrust on development of R&D ecosystem in, within the academic ecosystem of India, which augurs very well. 
Now, given these trends, I would now like to spend a few minutes on how government of India is trying to work to leverage these trends and work towards a more uh, comprehensive R&D ecosystem in defense and aerospace. Like I said, since our strengths lie in diverse set of stakeholders, including industry, academia, startups, etc. The first imperative of creating this comprehensive ecosystem is that we must have a plan to engage with each of these more aggressively. Let me talk of using our vibrant e industry for towards meeting our R&D requirements in defense. Several efforts have been made in this regard. We have initiated new programs. Our friends from India would be aware under which today R&D projects are being offered under Make 2 program for design and development for the industry. For the first time, we have also initiated a process by which the industry can suomoto propose to the forces the kind of systems, platforms that they can produce and based on the requirement of the services, procurement in this regard can be initiated. Today, DRDO has come out with a policy last year under which the TOT for technologies developed by DRDO are offered free of cost to industry to produce in the country. Similarly, it has also been decided that the access to DRDO patents will be available for any industry who needs these patents to develop any further improvement or some other larger platform based on these products. To further facilitate the industry in design and development, the testing infrastructure of the government, whether it is in DRDO or in the defense PSUs or with the services or any other government testing infrastructure, it has been thrown open for industry to use. Provisions under a new defense acquisition procedure have been brought by which pre-tested and cert globally accepted certificates will also be accepted in lieu of domestic testing. In addition to private industry, for the first time, defense PSUs have been encouraged to take up R&D based on the huge capabilities that they have created over the years. And I am happy to say that under the Mission Raksha Gyan Shakti program, the defense PSUs and OFB took up the challenge and have generated over 1000 patents in two years. And they have also taken up a program where each one of them are today developing products, especially those products which use new technologies like artificial intelligence, unmanned systems in close tie up with academia, startups and other partners. As part of this plan, DPSUs have also taken up a mandate to indigenize over 5000 components which are today imported for various platforms that are manufactured by them and thereby reducing their import dependence on these platforms.
DRDO has taken up the new model of co-development, co-design and development along with industry. So as against the previous model where DRDO initially used to do the development itself and then find a production partner, they now have started working with an industry partner right from the design stage itself. That is expected to reduce the development times and bring, it great, bring in greater ownership in terms of both the development, design development and the production cycle. Department of Defense Production is also in process of setting up defense testing infrastructure, which will be exclusively dedicated to new technology areas for the private industry. Under the new defense acquisition procedure, special focus has been given for using capabilities of domestic software industry and wherever such capabilities exist in the country, those will be tapped. A new area of technology development, which is been, uh, which has been a matter of some concern, has been uh, development of new materials. The new de defense acquisition procedure has a special chapter for making special efforts for making sure that materials that are used are as far as possible made available in India, certified in India and used for platforms developed in India. Another new approach that has been developed has been to look for new technologies elsewhere in the world and rather than looking at TOT, exploring the potential of acquiring those technologies. This is something which has been done by, very successfully by the private industry in the past. We are today now moving fast forward in terms of developing 5G technology within the country with the help of such uh, process of acquisition and it similarly in other areas where we have big technological gaps we could possibly use this method another reform that has been carried out has been that the offset requirements now allow acquiring technology as part of meeting the offset obligation and this is for the first time that such a provision has been included in the indian offset regulation in addition to developing the capability in the industry focus is also being given to further energize and innovate the defense technology ecosystem of DRDO, which has been providing human service for last several decades. Today, in certain areas, DRDO has been given the responsibility to make sure that all requirements in terms of missiles should be met. In fighter jets, moving forward from LCA, we are moving to fifth generation MK. In communication radars, in sonars, there is requirement of complete self-reliance. As a added determination, sign of determination, India has also announced a list of 101 items which we are confidently declaring that we would be able to design and produce indigenously and we will not have to depend on imports for them. Not only 
DRDO, but HAL has also taken upon itself to develop new capabilities in areas of its uh, work. Today, HAL has special capabilities in terms design capabilities in terms of helicopters, and it is moving towards from the LCH, which has been the mainstay of its helicopter production, to light utility helicopter, a three-ton helicopter, and in the next four to five years, they are developing the multi-role helicopter of 12-ton variety. So right from the lightest of helicopter to the heaviest of helicopter capability is being created. Fight, uh, basic trainer aircraft has been developed, designed and developed by HEL in-house and is now in uh, productions, is getting into uh, production stage. HEL is also further improving on its Dornier aircraft, which was now being converted into its civil version also. One of the areas where special effort needs to be taken and is that of the aero engine requirements. We have dependence for aero engines and we do understand that this gap cannot be full, met easily. To fulfill this gap, a special purpose vehicle involving stakeholders from DRDO, GTRE, who has been working on this, involving industry, involving user agencies, is proposed to be created, which will work on commercial basis and over the next medium five to 10 year period, it should start producing aero engine aero engines in india uh, lastly let me just briefly touch upon how the startup ecosystem has started contributing to our defense technology self reliance journey the innovation in defense excellence idex was a platform which was launched by Honorable Prime Minister in April 2018. And that was the first time that startups were invited to participate in defense technologies. It is heartening to see the absolutely tremendous response that has been generated by the large from the larger startup ecosystem. Today, there are over 1,000 startups who are creating defense technologies based on problem sets that have been thrown up by the services. The work of these startups have been remarkable. It has been catching global attention. Some of these startups have had international tie-ups also from uh, France, from US, where these countries have come and tied up with them. In our own experience, the work of startup has created capability, which is anything between 5x to 10x. And I say this because the cost of doing, doing the same development in the startup ecosystem has been five to 10 times short, lesser. And the time period for development has also been significantly low in having launched the program and the first set of challenges in August, in about 12 to 18 months, we have at least four to five technologies which are now ready to be inducted in the armed forces ecosystem coming out of the startups. Encouraged by this response, we propose that over the next five years, at least 50 new technologies from startup ecosystem, whether it is 
in terms of UAVs or in terms of uh, artificial intelligence or in terms of uh, 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 overall awareness, domain awareness, analytics. These technologies would be inducted uh, into the uh, defense ecosystem. And as, as I mentioned earlier, uh, at a fraction of a cost. The startup ecosystem has been so infectious that it has inspired a lot of our own uniformed uh, colleagues to contribute to this creative opportunity and to institutionalize the mechanism where people in the field who understand the problems and have ideas regarding their solutions these ideas can be channelized a variant of idex called idex for foggy has been launched recently which creates a institutional framework for officers and men of the services to contribute to the uh, startup ecosystem lastly let me mention that we are also working to see bringing greater uh, involvement in terms of creating chairs of excellence uh, development of indian defense university development of a system for setting up of an indian defense university and creating greater participation of youth and younger generation among our scientific community in forms of DRDO labs of scientists all below 35 years of age, all of which are creating today a whole new paradigm. So let me conclude by saying today we see in the technology preparation of defense and aerospace, aerospace sector, we are on the cusp of a watershed. It is for the first time that there is great amount of excitement, energy, hope, confidence, and the belief that this time India will be able to like it has done in other sectors like it has done in it like it has done in space like it has done in pharma it can also create its own defense and aerospace ecosystem thank you very much thank you very much uh, dr ajay kumar for uh, giving us uh, deep insights into the government of india's uh, new perspective in regard to uh, the defense production ecosystem. Uh, and I was particularly impressed with what you said about uh, uh, the fact that there can be no strategic independence uh, if there is continuing dependence on technology. So I think that's the heart of the matter today. And uh, thank you for also walking us through uh, your views with regard to the startup uh, ecosystem uh, and, and how we should leverage our strengths in software uh, and uh, in the academic system in order to create uh, a synergy between uh, policy uh, as well as private uh, industry and the efforts that they make in short and all of government, all of DPSU, all of OFB, all of private sector approach uh, with the DRDO of course uh, playing a key role as you just mentioned. Thank you very much again uh, for your remarks today. Uh, we are all very grateful uh, to you for joining us. Now, this brings us, uh, ladies and gentlemen, to uh, the Q&A session. Uh, I already have a large number of uh, questions here. Let me begin. Um, I may turn a little sideways because I'm operating two computers here. Uh, and, and there is no other twist to the matter except the fact that there are two computers. Uh, I begin with uh, a question by Major General Shami Raj, uh, who would like to know um, what are the challenges to our neighborhood first policy and how can we in particular handle the Chinese forays in our strategic neighborhood? 
I would suggest that uh, uh, perhaps uh, uh, Dr. Raja Mohan and the Defense Secretary, uh, if uh, they wish to, uh, may like to address this question. There are a couple of uh, straight questions for the Defense Secretary, and I shall endeavor to read them out uh, from Major General Brajesh Kumar. Uh, he asks, are we leveraging the Indian defense sector adequately in our foreign policy? Are we doing enough? Can we do more in terms of training, infrastructure, export of defense hardware, etc.? Of course, you have covered a great deal of this in the course of your remarks. Another one from Mr. Anonymous. Uh, it's a question related to uh, system-wide awareness of TRL and the relevance of a national tech audit in the context of adversarial tech development approach so as to avoid being shortchanged in partnerships. I'm quite confident that you will decipher that question better than I did. Um, but uh, there is one more for the Defense Secretary. Um, or is there? No, I move now to the Quad. Uh, in the current trends, uh, which indicate India's increasing thrust uh, on the Indo-Pacific and engagements with the United States and Quad partners, how does the panel see the um, Indo-Russian uh, relationship shaping up in the near future, especially in the area of military equipment? I will run through these and it is my intention to then go through the entire panel and request the panel to comment on whatever it is that they please to comment on, uh, including comments made earlier by panelists. Um, there is another question uh, by uh, SDS Air, uh, uh, Air Vice Marshal Upadhyay. What role will Russia play in the great power rivalry? Will Sino-Russian partnership last for long? given their bilateral history uh, and the circumstances under which Russia had no option but to join hands with China. Um, another one, uh, if you will permit me, I'm moving the cursor here. Uh, one from uh, Janmejai Sinha, chairman of India BCG, um, the Boston Consulting uh, Group. Uh, he asked, do you believe in the emerging world order with China rising as a superpower? Uh, do you believe that it is time now for India to review its uh, non-alignment policy and get more aligned with the United States and the larger Quad Plus uh, framework in which, uh, of course, there are others involved as well? Uh, this is straight up uh, your street, uh, Dr. Raja Mohan. Um, so you may uh, take to this very naturally. Um, I will quickly finish the other two or three. There's one rather long essay here, but I, I'm trying to get to the to the bottom of it. Uh, this is again to you, uh, uh, Professor Raja Mohan. You made mention about the rise of China and the uh, US-China relationship. In a way, he suggests that the rise of China, as did I in my uh, initial remarks, I suggested similarly that the US played a key role in the rise of uh, China. Uh, and its uh, economy. And now, apparently, according to the questioner, the birds have come home to roost. And he's wondering why the United States could not see through this earlier uh, than it uh, did. And uh, what exactly were a host of intelligence uh, agencies, etc., doing in the United States? Um, could they not uh, uh, see through this uh, taking shape over a number of years? And do you think that uh, the U.S. is taking adequate uh, action? Uh, are they timely or is it now uh, too late? And what impact will any action uh, on their part have uh, on the future future trajectory of uh, China? Uh, so is it a case of uh, uh, closing the barn door after the horses have bolted or is, the, is it still timely? Uh, Air Commodore R.A. Massacre, uh, another question to you. Uh, Raja, this is how should India navigate its bilateral and multilateral uh, relations with countries in our extended neighborhood under the shadow of US-China rivalry? And I'm putting across the last question now, uh, Raja, again for you to comment. Can Russia be considered uh, a dependable friend in the context of its special and, as he puts it, peculiar uh, relationship or peculiar relationship that China and India have? Can we consider Russia a, a special friend of ours, a reliable friend? 
So all this uh, is there for the panel to comment on. Um, and I will request uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Rajamohan to kick off. Uh, please uh, try and answer the questions that were directly addressed to you and feel free to comment on the rest. Uh, please try to be brief, uh, perhaps uh, five to six minutes, uh, five minutes at, at, at the most, and then I will turn over to other speakers. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ambassador. Uh, let me just uh, take up some of the because it's a lo lot of questions and it could take quite some time. The, I, I can't resist but ask, you know, responding to the question that why didn't the U.S. see China's rise? Uh, I think the same argument can be made to India. Uh, unlike China, unlike the US, uh, which not, did not face a territorial aggression from China, uh, that it actually used China as a way to balance uh, Russia. Uh, we had a problem with China in 1962. We then responded to that situation. Yet in the 1990s, we seem to have committed the same error of believing that we can have a peaceful coexistence with China. Now, I'm not blaming anyone. So I think if you look inwards, that our underestimation of the speed of China's rise and its consequences in the post-Cold War period was probably as damaging to us than the, what the Americans have done. It's up to them to deal with that issue. And I think uh, that doing the same mistake twice uh, uh, raises questions uh, about uh, what, how, well, we've been able to read the international situation. And I think that's very, very important for us as we as we look ahead. The second question, I, I think uh, in terms of uh, uh, no, you know, non-alignment, look, non-alignment is a permanent red herring we put for ourselves. That look, a country goes by its interests. So when Nehru faced with Chinese aggression, he turned to the US. Was that non-alignment? And what was our alliance with the Soviet Union in 1971 about? That we were responding to a US-China normalization and the close relationship with Pakistan, that we turned to the Soviet Union to set up an Indo-Soviet treaty. So all countries make alliances, whether we call them or not, that when you face a hostile external environment, you try to address the problem by increasing your power in partnerships with other countries. That's not a shock. That's not some uh, special condition that India has to deal with. Look at Pakistan's alliances with, the, with China and the United States earlier. Look at even smaller countries in our neighborhood that are willing to play the China card against us because they're trying to see how they can increase their maximum room for maneuver. So the question is not whether there is some kind of a mantra called non-alignment and we are to constantly you know, see whether we are doing the right thing. But as I said in my initial presentation, what is the threat you face and how do you deal with that threat? That is the operational question. Because on the question of non-alignment or strategic autonomy, the issue is every country wants to bargain with you. I mean, no, there's no free lunch. So therefore, we have to say, negotiate with other countries, find what is a mutual accommodation that we can work with, rather than there's somehow there is a if somehow there is this straight jacket called non-alignment that is going to permanently, we have to constantly remind ourselves every morning, am I strategically autonomous today? Am I sufficiently non-aligned uh, today? I and mean, I think this really takes you away from the main challenges that we face uh, in our own neighborhood. And I think we should really focus on those. And that brings me to the rise of China question in our neighborhood. Look, we can keep talking about neighborhood first, but the fact is that Today, you have China, which is the second largest economy in the world, soon to be number one in aggregate power. Can you keep that power away from your neighbors? Because we had the luxury that was left to us by the British, that you have some kind of an exclusive sphere of influence in South Asia. But today, rise of China on your borders in the Indian Ocean makes it, we have to work a lot harder to be able to retain our primacy in the region, which means how we deal with our neighbors on economic front, how we deal with our neighbors on security cooperation, how we resolve our problems with the neighbors. That's one set of issues. 
So merely saying neighborhood first is not enough and that we must resolve our problems with Pakistan, it doesn't look likely. And as the minister said, except with Pakistan, we move moving forward. But I think our work with our neighbors is a lot more because there is still one thing with India, which is geography. Whatever might happen on our frontier is that we have a longer border with Nepal. We have a, the, the southern slopes of Himalayas with Nepal and Bhutan coming to India. The historic ethnic connection. We have the longest border with Bangladesh. We are next to Sri Lanka and Maldives. That if our trade with them is less than that of China, it tells us something about India's economic policy. It doesn't tell us about the Chinese genius. Because Chinese are in Panama. Chinese are in Bella, Chinese are in every corner of the world as the second largest economy. But are we doing enough with our geography, our possibilities with our smaller neighbors? And I think that is the question. If we get our economy right, if we open our markets to our neighbors, if we create the conditions for deeper integration with our neighbors, I think you're halfway there in dealing with the, with the, with the China challenge. So uh, there again, I think we have to look at uh, ourselves and create policies that build on the natural interdependence that exists between India and the smaller neighbors. And I think we're moving in that direction, but I think we've got a long way to go because the rise of China has been fast and it is, leaves you with very little time and space uh, to get things, things right. Lastly on Russia. Look, it's not, Russia is not some innocent babe in the woods that has been pushed towards the Chinese. No, this idea somehow Russia has been pushed into the Chinese arms. Look, Russians have been doing statecraft for a thousand years. The state of rules goes back to a thousand years. They know geopolitics. It comes with their mother's milk. After all, China and Russia were allies in the 1950s. Both were communist. Ch Russia gave China nuclear weapons. So the, why Russia, China getting together? Yes, both have a problem with the US. So they're trying to create a stronger condition. Now, is Russia our best friend? Of course, it's a good friend of ours. Just as we try to manage the US-Russia relationship, the Russians will also try and manage the India-China contradiction. That is, they sell arms to both. They're nice to us. We want them to supply during the current crisis. They might, they will. So I think everyone is trying to balance their interests to say that somehow our partnerships are some kind of a marriage. It's not a Catholic marriage that, you know, you write permanent bonds. We'll never get what man is, God as united man cannot separate. Countries move. After all, in my lifetime, I've seen Russia's relationship with China change at least three times. So I think for us is to say, look, given my circumstances, how do I manage the external environment? How do I myself make myself stronger? That is a principal question. I think today, as the defense secretary pointed out, I mean, you're doing a lot of things, which has given you more leverage. So instead of worrying about, look, are Russians my dearest friends or not? Are they number one, number two in my hierarchy? Look, let's do what we can with, with every one of our partners, rather than starting with, who is my best friend today? I think if you are strong, uh, others will deal with us. Others have more stakes with us. If you are strong, they have more business with us. They will be nice to us rather than merely saying, who is my best friend? Who is not my best friend? There again, I think it, it goes against the core principles. I'm going back to Kautilya's, or Kautilya's name or picture on the book that the defense minister has released. Look, it is about interests that you manage your interests. And if you go to Kautilya's Rajamandala, your neighbors, if there is a powerful neighbor next door, that is a problem. So you make friends with the neighbor's neighbor. We didn't need Machiavelli to tell us. This is what Kautilya told us. So, so I think we must go back to first principles of statecraft, which is partnerships, alliances to deal with the threats while strengthening yourself internally, which is what Kautilya talks about. A just rule inside, a strong economy will produce the conditions under which you can produce an external balance. And, and I think that should be your strategy rather than worrying about who is with us, what is the mantra, are we with the mantra or not? I mean, so let me conclude by referring to Pakistan. Pakistan signed in 1954 a bilateral security agreement with the United States. It was meant to be against the communists. Pakistan joined Seattle and Cento, which was meant to be against the communists, 1954. In five years, they were dealing with the Chinese. They made a deal with the Chinese while signing an agreement with the Americans. And then they become the bridge between US and China. It is Pakistan that facilitates Kissinger's travel to, from Pakistan's secret trip to China. 
So countries respond to their circumstances. You know, this is not a pre-cooked recipe that somehow some of our grandfathers gave it and that we're going to carry it in our pocket and to keep looking for the roadmap. And I think the burden is on us today to start from the first principles. What are the threats we face? What are the opportunities we have? Rather than saying, here is my mantra. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Raja Mohan, and also for allowing us uh, a peek into your view of the Raja Mandalas. Your Raja Mandalas are, are also very interesting for all of us, educative as well. I now turn to Ambassador Peter Varghese, uh, a few thoughts on these issues that have been raised so far and the questions that have been posed. Um, thanks, Sir John. Look, I'll, I'll just make a couple of observations and I won't get into the tricky area of India's own choices. Uh, I don't think that would be particularly uh, useful for, for me to do that. On this question of whether we were all terribly naive and misled about China, look, I, I think this is a bit of retrofitting historical judgment. Um, the truth is the opening to China, it'll be 50 years soon, was essentially a strategic calculation made on the Cold War chessboard, and it made sense at the time. But by the time China had decided to go down the path of opening up its economy in the late 70s and then picking up pace in the late 90s, um, our relationships with China were more through an economic prism than they were through a geopolitical prism because that's where the weights at the time actually sat um, and you know bear in mind that while we always knew that china was a leninist system whose primary objective was for the party to hang on to power um, and i don't think um, at least in australia we had any delusions about China becoming a Jeffersonian democracy off the back of economic growth. Um, the, um, the, 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 the reality is that it was China's change in position which has created the, the, the fault line that we now are facing. So through the 80s and 90s, I think China's strategic ambitions were a matter of speculation but not certainty. I think China's position fundamentally started to change with the abandonment of hide and bide, with a recalibration of the decline of US strategic power um, and with a sense that the window of opportunity had opened to China and they should march through it. Now they may turn out to be completely flawed judgments, but I think that's what's driven China's current position in terms of its strategic objectives. So to say that we'd all made a terrible mistake, I think is to, is to simplify a much more complicated issue. Um, on, um, on, on Russia, look, the, the, the point I'd make about Russia um, is um, Russia is a spoiler, not a shaper. Um, and I think that reflects the contrast between its actual weight uh, and its historical ambitions and its sense of self and its feeling that it went through uh, the humiliation of the collapse of the Soviet Union. So I think Russia will be essentially an opportunistic strategic power. I think that the China-Russia relationship is an axis of opportunism more than anything else. Um, where India uh, settles with Russia, obviously that's India's choice. I suspect India will want to hang on to this relationship if for no other reason it's a demonstration that it hasn't let go completely of non-alignment and strategic autonomy. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Varghese, uh, for uh, again sharing your thoughts. Uh, and for putting the opening to China in that particular historical context. Uh, I now request uh, the Defense Secretary of India, Dr. Ajay Kumar, to share his thoughts and to also uh, specifically address uh, the couple of questions that were addressed to him. <clears throat> so let me start by talking about the larger issue of relationship with neighborhood, relationship with Russia, relationship with other countries, US, Quad, etc. 
No, I think as has been very rightly said, today we are in a situation, the world is in a situation, I'm not talking of India specifically, where each country is dealing with multiple relationships uh, and they are working with these relationships, balancing uh, these relationships to the extent that their values and their goals align. But as a result, we do see some of these contradictions that are emerging in to a very simplistic uh, analysis that should India be working in the Quad and should India be working with Russia as well. I think the real important thing that defines all of this is that the relationship is defined as long as the basic values for which the country stands for are aligned with the other countries or in a multilateral environment with set of countries, you are working with them. We have made it very clear that we are for a free, inclusive, rule-based order. And we do not believe in any one country trying to unilaterally try to dominate its position over others by force or otherwise. Now, wherever that happens, you know, and wherever forces which align with us, I think it is this value system that is most important from, from our perspective and we work with those countries. The second thing I would like to mention is that India, where it is in its life cycle of economic development, it is very important from our perspective and from that perspective, most of South Asia and a whole lot of other countries in this region that growth, economic growth is equally important and therefore we have to see how our overall strategic objectives align with the growth of the people. The people of this region have been economically been left behind compared to many other parts of the world and while we are making sure that we make uh, that our geopolitical interests are protected we also have to take our economic agenda forward and to that that is the other basic value that defines our relationship with other countries and there are a lot of synergies in this respect with our neighborhood there are a lot of synergies in this respect with ASEAN and there are a lot of synergies with, in this respect with our extended uh, friends that we have done. The problem only arises where we see a direct conflict in these value systems. And I would just like to end on this point by saying that we have shown very clearly that when these values are attacked or are going to be challenged, we will stand up to them. We have stood up to the what has happened on the eastern uh, border and we have stood up to any pressure that was mounted against us in this regard. So it is important today to show that we will have our value system which defines our relationship with our countries. and. Based on this, we will be able to uh, stand up based on our value system. Now, let me come to some of the points relating to defense technologies that were specifically uh, asked of me. One was, are we leveraging our capabilities well enough? If you ask me honestly, I think we have not been leveraging as much as we should have leveraged. We have now started in the last few years, we have started to, we have made initial forays to change this. I mean, we have today for the first time started making our technologies available to friendly foreign countries. We have today for the first time, I mean, today means in the last few years, we have for the first time started making lines of credit available in defense. We are today we are expanding our overall profile of military training and capabilities 
with our friendly foreign countries. So today we have large number of requests that come to us saying that, would you be willing to share what capabilities that exist in the countries in various sectors? And yes, today we are trying to accommodate as many of those requests as possible. And therefore, we, we think today we recognize it's important to leverage these trends and we are moving in that direction. As regards, uh, you know, the question on tech audit uh, with adversarial capabilities, the kind of capabilities, with advers uh, you know, adversary and especially, uh, you know, uh, today with China uh, really zipping ahead in terms of technology and in terms of numbers. We do, we have our tech audit, uh, you know, uh, we do this all the time. The question is, how can we actually keep pace with the audit that we carry? And I think it is in this regard today, you know, especially in new areas of technology, I mentioned 5G earlier. I mean, if new technology is going to define how the countries are going to be dominate the uh, defense sphere of the future, it is imperative that this collaboration in defense area should include collaboration in defense technologies also. And defense technologies are today increasingly becoming uh, dual use technologies like 5G and future 6G. Today, if China has nearly 50 to 60% of the IPR for 5G, it is also uh, required that the countries with similar thinking can come together and create 6G technologies together, which can give an alternative. So I think tech audit, along with tech audit, the ability to match up with the tech audit and strategies for those also need to be uh, figured out. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, to all our three panelists. Uh, uh, this really brings us uh, to the very end of our uh, session. Uh, we began a little late, so I'm tempted to steal a few minutes uh, from the so-called lunch hour, if, if there is uh, some such uh, virtual lunch hour. Uh, I have been asked to say a few words at the end uh, as part of my onerous duty as uh, the uh, chair for this uh, session. And it's a particular honor to do so. Uh, I'm not going to attempt to summarize anything uh, that uh, all our three uh, speakers have said in such uh, an erudite fashion. Um, but uh, there are a few points that I thought I should emphasize. And one of this is uh, this uh, discourse about India's non-alignment on which uh, our speakers uh, uh, you know, dwelt th this uh, afternoon. Um, we have moved uh, from non-alignment to, uh, you know, description of our strategic autonomy. Uh, but as uh, Dr. Raja Mohan clearly brought out, it has never prevented India from exercising its choices. Uh, and that exactly is the true meaning of uh, strategic autonomy. In 1962, we had approached the United States for uh, war material and military assistance at the time of uh, the uh, unexpected Chinese aggression. And a decade later, we were able to smoothly uh, move into a similar kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, arrangement uh, treaty of, uh, uh, you know, cooperation uh, with uh, the Soviet Union. Uh, so uh, strategic autonomy is uh, essentially the exercise of these choices. And I suppose we are doing exactly that today as we work with our partners, such as the United States, Japan, Australia, France, and so on. I also think that uh, the point that was made about uh, intra-South uh, Asian trade and economic flows uh, as being a factor uh, in the fullest uh, uh, realization of India's own potentials, I think that cannot be overstated. And uh, it is a matter of fact that uh, intra-South Asian trade and economic uh, uh, flows are among the poorest in the world. So we have to uh, naturally uh, focus much more on that and perhaps also take a page out of uh, what happened in East Asia, because we've seen in the rise of China that uh, the region, regional economic integration played a very key role. Uh, on the opening to China uh, being a strategic calculation uh, at a particular point of time uh, in the Cold War, where the Soviet Union was pulling ahead, 
at least in military terms, it never really had a big economy, but it was a menacing scientific and uh, military power. Uh, by the time the Americans and the Chinese both decided to uh, forge a strategic relationship of their own to deal with that. But the fact of the matter is that uh, the Chinese had all along looked at the Americans even during uh, and before uh, this partnership uh, in the context of uh, encirclement by the United States. Uh, and I suppose the, the wheel has come full circle today uh, with the collapse of the Soviet Union, there being no binding glue after the 1990s. Uh, and particularly given the rise of China, China has naturally transitioned back into that old encirclement uh, uh, complex vis-a-vis the United States. They, they never, never really abandoned that uh, uh, throughout that relationship. I think uh, both sides were making particular use of uh, each other. Uh, as far as China is concerned, we've also seen uh, that uh, they have made use of external balancing throughout the last 70 years, particularly after the end of the Second World War. We have seen, as was brought out by the speakers, the reference to a, an early relationship with the Soviet Union uh, in the form of the 1950 uh, agreement. Uh, and uh, thereafter, the pendulum has swung in favor of the United States as well in the 1970s. So what's good for the goose, of course, is equally good for the gander. And uh, external balancing is very much uh, a requirement uh, for uh, all countries, I would say, not just uh, India or Australia or Japan or the United States. Uh, China, of course, has gamed the WTO. It has gamed many things. We have this uh, uh, sort of spectacle today of uh, the dominant power, the United States, which should never be underestimated. It has phenomenal capacities, both uh, technological and military, even today, very much intact and on the rise. Uh, that country uh, voluntarily gave space in multilateral structures and in the geostrategic uh, theater, including in the Asia Pacific theater, uh, because of a, a focus on its uh, other priorities, such as the international war on terror, which created a vacuum, which was also used by China to its advantage. The abandoning, of course, of continuous revolution uh, by China came early on, uh, and uh, then uh, the four modernizations, and then, of course, the relinquishing of that uh, uh, old uh, tongue uh, aphorism of uh, hide your capabilities and bide your time. Uh, so China has shown this great capacity uh, for adjustment, uh, but its adjustment to uh, the relative rise of others has been very poor. It has expected the entire world to adjust to its rise, which is, of course, mercurial, uh, phenomenal. It's taken place in a short span of uh, four decades. But uh, I think China has not really understood the nature of power, uh, the various characteristics of power, the dimensions under which it can be judiciously exercised without inviting a pushback. And I think that is what has led to uh, this uh, grating uh, of tectonic plates at the geostrategic level. Uh, just as China expects others to adjust to its rise, it must also adjust to the relative rise of others. And there should be greater transparency, not only with regard to its capabilities, which are uh, particularly clear and self-evident, but also China's intentions. That calls for greater dialogue between China and the rest of the world. I think uh, we've had uh, an extraordinary session today. You will all agree. Um, we will continue to work on some of these points that have been made today about the Quad, about the centrality of ASEAN. Uh, but I want to remind our uh, listeners today that uh, on ASEAN centrality, one particular point strikes me, which is that in the uh, uh, negotiation of the uh, code of conduct there, we must keep in mind that it is really China alone that's involved with the ASEAN. So therefore, ASEAN centrality can emerge as a double-edged sword. Uh, for in the negotiations, China has been and will continue to exercise profound influence on some, if not all, ASEAN countries. Uh, so much for that. Um, uh, really, I seem to have covered uh, most points uh, uh, without really doing justice to uh, the great scholarship that the panelists uh, uh, brought uh, to these uh, topics. I want to thank each one of our panelists today uh, for sparing their time. Uh, amidst their busy schedules and numerous other engagements. And I also want to take this opportunity to thank uh, uh, you, Mr. Rohit Gandhi, 
uh, for having introduced us to your vast audience today that exceeds uh, and goes beyond uh, merely, merely the uh, participants at the NDC, I'm told. Um, and I want to thank the NDC in particular, its commandant, uh, Air Marshal Chaudhary, for having invited me to chair this, uh, what I would deem to be a very successful uh, kickoff uh, to this uh, virtual webinar today. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I wish you good health and success in all your endeavors. Uh, Mr. Gandhi, your mic seems to be muted. And no audio, please. Not yet. No audio, please. Uh, that's it from me then. I couldn't hear uh, Mr. Gandhi uh, when he attempted those few words, but uh, thank you once again. Thank you, Mr. Gandhi. I'm signing off on this note. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ambassador Chinoy, uh, for uh, session one. Now, what we've realized is that competing ambitions of different nations is going to keep our world in turmoil. A global framework where the system is important for it to function well. But going forward, I think there is going to be understanding that framework, which is going to become very, very important. Ladies and gentlemen, we've now come to the end of session two. The next session begins at 14.30 hours. The session title is India in Transformation. You may log out or stay uh, online and stay logged in. And we'll be back at 14.30 hours India time.